वेलकम टू ईपीजी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर नीरू टंडन फ्रॉम डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ इंग्लिश वी एस एस डी कॉलेज कानपुर इन दिस मॉड्यूल नंबर थर्टीन रिटर्न बाई मी आई एम गोइंग टू टॉक अबाउट एलिजाबेथ बेरेट ब्राउनिंग Elizabeth Barrett Browning a great poet of 19th century England her poetic output is immense in this module we'll come to know about browning her life and her limitations as a poet her contribution towards the english poetry and her poetic style we will also discuss three of her poems in detail to name them to george sand recognition to george sand a desire and the cry of the children but before going through her poems let us understand and know about the poetess Elizabeth Barrett Browning was one of the most prominent English poets of the Victorian era her poetry was widely popular in both Britain and the United States she was born on March 6th 1806 in the United Kingdom she died June 29th 1861 in Italy She was the wife of a great poet Robert Browning and she had one son Robert Barrett Browning known as Pen Elizabeth Barrett Browning was also known as title Ba She was an English poetess of the romantic movement This movement was popularly known as a movement of literature art and architecture in it mrs robert browning was best known for her love poems of course she was known popularly as mrs robert browning and she always liked that her poems love poems sonnets and her volume of poems in the name of poems published in 1844 and that brought her great success she had 11 siblings and she was the oldest out of them her father edward berrett was a slave plantation owner in jamaica and one thing that is very important that he was a person of great authority and he never allowed elizabeth to go out and do whatever she wanted to do elizabeth barrett browning grew up during the time of slavery she always opposed slavery and she wrote the seraphim and other poems in 1838 that included some of her views she expressed sympathy for italy's struggle for unification and the austrian oppression of the italians her views are expressed in some of her poems whenever we go through her poems we come across her views regarding these issues as well elizabeth barrett browning she was an attractive young woman with large eyes dark curly hair and a diminutive figure with an easy smile and a charming personality during her lifetime she was held in higher regard than browning as a poet she was even tipped to succeed william wordsworth as a poet laureate in 1850 barrett was an avid and voracious reader that was her quality and at the age of 9 she had gone through the histories of england greece rome and the plays like othello tempest part of pope's homeric translations 
and passages from Paradise Lost. Imagine at the age of 11, she felt the desire to understand various other languages like Greek and Latin and she learned them from a tutor who used to come to her house to teach her brother Edward, popularly known as Bro. Now, history's most important literary marriage, the marriage of Elizabeth and Browning, Robert Browning, that took place in 1846. The courtship and marriage between Robert Browning and Elizabeth Browning were carried out secretly for fear of her father's disapproval. Later, her fear proved true and she was disinherited by her father and rejected by her brothers because of this marriage. Even then, she carried on and the couple moved to Italy in 1846, where she would live for the rest of her life. They had one son, Robert Barrett Browning, whom they called Penn. Barrett was, as Robert Browning later asserted, self-taught in almost every respect. That was the qualification that was acknowledged by almost everyone, including Browning, of course. During the years of her marriage to Robert Browning, her literary reputation far surpassed that of the poet husband. When visitors came to their home in Florence, she was invariably the greater attraction. Towards the end of her life, her lung function worsened and she died in Florence in 1861. She died in the arms of her husband, Robert Browning. The great love between the couple was a talk of the town. People used to give references of their love. Very talented Elizabeth wrote 44 sonnets in her notebook so secretly that even her husband could come to know about them after three years of their marriage in 1849. After going through those sonnets, he was so impressed with the beauty and technique of the sonnets that he insisted that they must get published and they got published with the name poems in 1850. None of Mrs. Browning's poems has received more attention from feminist critics than Aura Lee. Yes, Aura Lee. That was the name given to the poem that just discussed the rights of the women. Since its theme is one that especially concerns them, the difficulties that a woman must overcome if she is to achieve independence in a world mainly controlled by men. She wrote profusely between 1841 to 1844. She wrote prose, poetry, translations and sonnet, of course. Her abundant output made her a competitor to Tennyson, the great Victorian poet, the most representative poet of the Victorian age. And she was in competition for Poet Laureate after William Wordsworth. One of Mrs. Browning's most fundamental convictions was that sexual activity outside of marriage was immoral. What I mean that about extramarital relationship, she always had a big no-no. But she believed that society should be more compassionate in its treatment of women who had been victims of seduction or sexual attacks. Because in Victorian society, even the victim of rape, victim of sexual attack, they were also considered as not as victims, but not as oppressor, but as oppressors. So that may be the reason that women readers, they were stunned by the story of the Marian, that is the character of Orali. Now, another thing that we must take care, that is Mrs. Browning's experiments in the field of poetry. She experimented a lot with the sonnet. 
her 28 sonnets on various subjects were Italian in form. They were divided into two parts. You know that there are two kind of sonnets. One is Shakespearean and the other is Italian. An Italian sonnet has got two parts, octave and sestet. Now the first eight lines rhyme A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A. And in the last six lines, Mrs. Browning used two different patterns. That is C, D, C, D, C, D. While others, they used C, D, E, C, D, E. So that was a difference in Mrs. Browning's experimentation with sonnets. Now, how do I love thee? Without discussing this sonnet, that is the sonnet number 43, you just cannot assess Mrs. Browning as a love poetess. Mrs. Browning's love poems, they touched the heart of the readers. They just moved their emotions. Let me discuss how do I love thee. I am just going through the poem written by her. In her own words, I quote, How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach. When feeling out of sight, for the ends of being an ideal grace, I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need by sun and candlelight. I love thee freely as men strive for right. I love thee purely as they turn from praise. I love thee with the passion put to use in my old griefs and with my childhood's faith. I love thee with a love I seemed to lose with my lost saints. I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life. And if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. Just see how beautiful the sonnet is. How beautifully she describes her passion, her love for her husband to be husband Robert Browning. Her love needs no bounds and that is fully expressed in a beautiful way by the poetess. It is a patriarchal sonnet and the rhyme scheme of this sonnet is as follows. Lines 1 to 8. ABAB, again ABAB, and 9 to 14, CD, CD, CD. Now, the octave draws analogies between the poet's love and religious and political ideals. The sestet draws analogies between the intensity of love she felt while writing the sonnet and the intensity of love she experienced in her life. Then it says that she will love her better and more after death. What she meant that her love is not the earthly love. What she meant that her love is not limited to bodies only. Even after the death of the bodies, she will continue loving her husband because the love was for the soul, for the man of her life. Now, this is the intense love that is the theme of the sonnet. As I told you, it is sonnet number 43. It expresses the poet's intense love for her husband to be Robert Browning. So intense is her love for him, she says, that it rises to the spiritual level in line 3 and 4. She loves him freely, without coercion. She loves him purely, without expectation of personal gain. She even loves him with an intensity of the suffering resembling that of Christ on the cross. And she loves him in the way that she loved saints as a child. Moreover, she expects to continue to love him even after her death. The dominant figure of his speech in the poem is anaphora. Yes, anaphora is a figure of his speech in which the repetition of words is there. The use of I love thee in eight lines and I shall but love thee in the final line. That makes it anaphora. The repetition builds rhythm while reinforcing the theme. 
Browning also used alliteration in the poem throughout. Now it has been written in iambic pentameter, 10 syllables or 5 feet per line with 5 pairs of unstressed and stressed syllables as line 2 and 3 of the poem demonstrate. For example, you can just mark it. I am reading line 2 and 3 with the stress on the syllables. I love the two, the depth and breadth and height. Just take attention towards love, two, depth, breadth, height. So making it five. The next line says, my soul can reach when feeling out of sight. Again the five words on which poetess wants that the emphasis should be given. Now another important poem, The Cry of the Children by Elizabeth Barrett Browning. It is totally a different poem from the poem we were discussing till now. The Cry of the Children tells about Elizabeth's compassion towards destitutes, towards have-nots, towards children who were not that lucky. I quote some lines from the poems. Do ye hear the children weeping? O my brothers, ere the sorrow comes with years, they are leaning their young heads against their mothers and that cannot stop their tears. But the young, young children, O my brothers, they are weeping bitterly. They are weeping in the playtime of the others in the country of the free. Do you question the young children in the sorrow? Why their tears are falling so? The old man may weep for his tomorrow, which is lost in long ago. The Cry of the Children, published in 1842, talks about child labor and questions adults if they would have also preferred to be in the similar situation. It had its roots when Elizabeth heard the cries of little children who were forced to work in mines and factories in a very, very bad condition. You may just remind of Charles Dickens also who just gave his attention towards these issues in her novels. The poet talks about the religion and untimely death of the children without any proper medication. Now, poem, it lays bare the real agony of the deprived children who could not even get a proper burial. Elizabeth feels pain. She expresses this pain very beautifully through this poem. She compares children with tender roots that require due attention and proper care. The poem is intentionally didactic, political in purpose as well as subject matter. The use of language, meter and rhyme in the poem demonstrates her innovative poetics and singular style. To George Sand a recognition. Another poem by Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Let me go through some lines by this poetess I quote, Thy woman's hair, my sister, all unshorn, floats back disheveled strength in agony, disproving thy man's name, and while before the word thou burnest in a poet fire, we see thy woman heart beat evermore, through the large flame beat purer heart and higher, till God unsex thee on the heavenly shore, where an incarnate spirits purely aspire. Before understanding this poem, you must understand Victorian society. How Victorian society treated women in general, you know. There the ideal women had just two roles, marriage and procreation. They had no liberty, sex, discussion of sex that was out of question and although Elizabeth Browning practically venerated George Sand and held her in high regard for competing so beautifully 
in the literary world. She remembers in her poem to George Sand a recognition that women must not forget their womanhood because being a woman is very important and unless and until you understand the importance of womanhood, you cannot justify the role you have got to play in your society and in your family. Morlier, a great critic, he argues that through the use of the word unsex, Barrett addressed a cliché in anti-feminist journalism. In her poem of recognition, Elizabeth Barrett suggests that although a woman can appear to deny her womanhood with manly scorn, she will always remain a woman. Next poem is To George Sand, A Desire. First, I will quote some lines from this poem and then I will tell you about it. Thou large-brained woman and large-hearted man, self-called George Sand, and man's might as join beside the angel's grace of a pure genius sanctified from blame, till child and maiden press to thine embrace to kiss upon thy lips a stainless fame. Now you see that in this poem to George Sand a desire, there is, it is a companion poem with to George Sand a recognition. And this poem of desire, Elizabeth Barrett uses George Sand's example to tell women to follow one's dreams and that too without any shame. She just encouraged them that it is important for you to follow your dreams, to do what you want to do and there is no shame in doing something for yourself. Another important thing to note is what Elizabeth says, Thou large-brained woman and large-hearted men. In this line, Browning compliments George Sand's amalgamation of intellect and sensitivity in her writings. Now just notice that when she says that large-brained woman and large hearted men. Now what she is doing? She is switching the characteristics typically assigned to specific genders in Victorian society. She says that women are large brained, they are witty. You are not supposed to take them just for their physical beauty. So they are large brained and at the same time men she is calling large hearted. Why? Because only large hearted men could understand large brained women. Self called George Sand. It refers to Sand using a pen name rather than her real name. Self called. Barrett dedicated this poem to George Sand because she admired that Sand could accomplish so much despite being a woman in man's world. In this poem, Barrett examines the unfair roles given to men and women in the society and questions their need in a world holding talent by a woman like Sand. She wanted that more and more women should come forward and just present themselves in front of society to change this gender discrimination. One very important thing to know about Mrs. Browning's life is the connection between Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Browning. It was the literary marriage of the age. People just admired them because throughout their life they lived happily and in love. I would like to mention over here that on 9th December 1846, Elizabeth Barrett and Robert Browning married secretly. And it was not possible until she received a fan letter from Mr. Browning. Barrett showed every sign of complying with her father's ban on marriage. And she wanted that she should 
follow her father's will. But 20 months later, 575 letters from Browning and almost daily visits, Barrett would shed her grave clothes and walked out of the bedroom that was not possible otherwise and she eloped with Robert Browning to get married for her lifetime. To sum up, Elizabeth Barrett Browning as a woman, as a wife, as a poetess, she is exemplary in all her roles. When you go through the love lyric, how do I love thee? You feel the pleasure. You feel the pleasure of being a woman. You feel the pleasure of being a beloved. When you go through the cry of the children, you feel a sensitive human being who is crying, who is feeling the problems of child, child labor, who is working in the mines, who is being ill-treated, who are dying without medical help. Then when you go through George Sand, a desire, then you understand that the gender discrimination pains her. So all these issues are well taken by Elizabeth Barrett Browning in her poems and she was successful in her career as a poet during her lifetime and well admired not only by her husband Robert Browning but by great poets like Emily Dickinson and others in her lifetime. Thank you for visiting EPG Patshala.